So uh, you got a 12 volt lead acid battery uh, that you want to use to power your phone charger in order to obviously charge up your phone. And you also want to power this light bulb while you're at it. The reasonable thing to do uh, would be to simply buy a proper inverter, connect the battery, uh, hook up the appliances and that's it. But you're not reasonable and want to save money. Which is why you went to Google Images instead and looked for inverter schematics that you can build at home for cheap. And this one right here attracted your attention. You thought to yourself, only 7 components, what could possibly go wrong? Well, in this episode of testing circuits I found on the internet, I will show you exactly what can go wrong by building up these circuits, properly testing it and finding out what problems the design comes with that the schematic will certainly never tell you about. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by Brilliant, which is a website and app that I would describe as an interactive storyteller, where you can learn all about math, science and computer science. Now since my videos require knowledge about electricity, I had a closer look at the electricity and magnetism course. And I was pleasantly surprised that while this course was still easy to understand, there were lots of important details and interactive puzzles that kept everything very interesting and engaging. So if you want to try out Brilliant for yourself, then go to brilliant.org slash greatscott and sign up for free. And the first 200 people that sign up for an annual subscription through this link will also get a 20% discount. First off, I drew my own schematic based on the chosen one. But I had to replace the BJT and MOSFET components with other types, since I didn't have the intended components laying around. Which does not really matter though, since my replacement parts are very similar to the original. And with that being said, I gathered all the components mandatory for the circuits. For the transformer parts, I went with the safety transformer that comes with a 230 volt winding as well as a 24 volt winding that I can center tap and thus the transformer should be suitable for the circuit. Now the cost of those components equals around $40, which is kind of budget friendly. And building up these circuits on a breadboard according to the schematic was also simple and fast to do as long as you remember that you can find the pinout of the more complex components in their datasheets. So after double checking all of the connections, it was time to test the circuit with my lab bench power supply. And it seems like the circuit didn't feel like working yet. But after adding a bit of capacitance to the input of the circuit as a buffer, the current consumption seemed normal and thus it was time to hook up the 12 volt battery. The good thing was that nothing blew up and all the components remained pretty cool, which was a good sign. We were also getting around 202 volts AC RMS on the outputs, which basically means that the circuit works. But I also have to warn you that working with such mains voltage levels can lead to fatal injuries if not handled correctly. Okay. So after connecting the light bulb to the system and powering it all up once again, you can see that it does light up without any problems. At this point you might be thinking that powering the phone charger should work just fine as well. Right? Well, before doing that, let's rather find out how this circuit works and why it is actually not a good inverter even though it seemed like it so far. Luckily, the schematic I found on Google Images led to a website where the circuit and its application is explained in detail. And one of the first things I read was that the circuit is a multivibrator that creates a closely resembling sinusoidal waveform. So let's just hook up my oscilloscope to the circuit and have a look at those sinusoidal waveforms. 
Okay, I do not feel like trusting this website anymore. So let me explain how this A-stable multivibrator circuit functions. When 12 volts is first applied to the circuits, both BJTs and MOSFETs are turned off. But current can flow through each base of the BJTs. But since every transistor is a bit different, one of them will conduct first and thus turn on. Which in my case is the right one. At that moment the right MOSFET gate is pulled to ground, which means it is off. While the left MOSFET gate is connected to a now freshly charged up capacitor and thus turned on. Now the right capacitor on the other hand is connected to ground on the right side and thus slowly charging up through the left side, which is connected to the base of the left turned off transistor. And at a certain threshold voltage current will flow through its base and turn it on. At this point the left capacitor will get discharged and thus the left MOSFET turns off, meaning that the capacitor now has to charge up with the reverse polarity, which therefore means that the right BJT turns off. That however means that the right capacitor now quickly got charged up with a reverse polarity and therefore now the right MOSFET gate sees a positive voltage and thus turns on. This process basically repeats over and over again, creating a more or less nice looking square wave at the gate of the two MOSFETs. The frequency at which this oscillation occurs is set by these resistors and capacitors and can be calculated approximately like this. In my case the use components deliver a frequency of around 50 Hz which is the same as with the mains AC voltage here in Germany. Last but not least we got the two MOSFETs which with the frequency of 50 Hz pull current alternately through the low voltage transformer winding which therefore should create a higher AC voltage with the same waveform on the high voltage side of the transformer. And according to the oscilloscope it does just that. So overall the circuit works. But after doing a couple of tests I noticed some rather big problems. First off if we alter the input voltage which is pretty common considering that a 12 volt lead acid battery also discharges over time. The output voltage as well as the frequency of it changes quite a bit. Due to the obvious nature of the circuits by using a transformer and an RC timer circuit. This frequency and voltage drift does also occur over time without changing any voltages. Since the components do heat up a bit as well. And last but not least the output also changes noticeably if we connect the loads. This can be a problem for sensitive electronics and can be pretty much only solved if we monitor the voltage and frequency on the outputs and adjust the input voltage as well as maybe the resistance of the RC timer circuits with a digital potentiometer in order to always hit that 50 Hz 230 volts arm as sweet spots. So basically put a feedback circuit is missing. Next we can observe while looking at the drain pin of the MOSFETs that there is a big voltage spike with values of up to 65 to 70 volts, which is above the maximum rated drain source voltage and thus this could destroy the MOSFETs over time. The reason could be unwanted and or parasitic inductances. And to solve that problem we would have to add an RC snubber circuit to the drain source path. After doing just that the voltage peaks were reduced to relatively safe levels. But if we have a closer look at the output voltage of the transformer then we can also observe spikes with values of around 650 volts that have the potential to kill your appliances. The reason for this ringing is the utilized sharp square wave voltage which by the way you can hear way more through the transformer in comparison to for example a sinusoidal waveform. To get rid of this problem we would have to attach a constant load to the outputs, for which I chose a 40 kilo ohm resistor network. As you can see it reduced the voltage peaks to values of around 350 volts. 
Now these three issues were my main problems with the circuits, of which two we easily solved. But there are still tons of minor problems, like not featuring a proper sinusoidal output voltage, or not having an under voltage protection that saves your 12 volt battery from getting over discharged. And since most people will be using a wrong kind of transformer for this build, most of the times the output voltage will just collapse with certain power loads, or in some cases create funny looking waveforms that can also harm your electronics. So all in all, while your phone charger might power up with your online schematic inverter, it can still do some serious damage, like in my case completely frying my old smartphone. No joke. But in the end, I want to say that my intention here was not to badmouth the website this schematic came from, or all the other schematics you can find with Google Images. I think it is great that you can find so much electronics knowledge on the internet nowadays. But I just wanted to prove to you that you should not believe that every circuit you see works flawlessly. And with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you find other schematics that I should test, then let me know in the comment section below. As always, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Stay creative and I will see you next time!